Where I recommend reaching out to schools is if you have a Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAT. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am great. What can I help you with? So I just have a couple questions. So I'm planning on applying this upcoming cycle. And I'm just wondering if there's a school and a program that you're really interested in, is there anything you should be doing at this point to kind of show your interest or... um, Like, would you recommend um, possibly like emailing or calling um, admissions or do they just see that? um, Do they view that more as an annoying thing? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. I I think the far majority of students, the way that they do it is probably more on the annoying side because they're just like, hey, I'm going to apply to you. Just want to say hello. It's like, yeah, got it. Like, send your application. We'll look at you with everyone else. Where I recommend reaching out to schools is if you have a very specific question that you think it would impact your ability to get into that school or impact kind of your trajectory and things that you need to do to apply and get into that get into that school. What I mean by that is if you're missing a very specific prereq or you're missing a specific letter of recommendation that that school says that they require then potentially reaching out and saying, hey, I'm a non-traditional student and you require these letters of recommendations, but I can only get these ones and here's why. Is it okay if I replace this one required letter with this other letter? Or, hey, you require this one random prereq that I haven't taken. Is it okay if I take it later? The far majority of schools are fine with taking prereqs after you apply, after you've even been accepted. So that's typically not a problem either. The other potential reason to reach out would be, hey, I really struggled early on in my academic career. I want to come to your school for XYZ. Do you have any sort of cutoffs that I may be filtered out? Or uh, will my upward trend help overcome any of that? Do you have any other advice? So reaching out for some advice in terms of academics. Do I need to do a post back? Do I need to do a master's? Or hey, I'm, I'm deciding between an undergraduate level post back and a special master's program. Do you recommend one over the other? So those are very specific questions that you can reach out and ask the school about. I wouldn't have a list of 10 questions. I would reach out with a specific question. Where most students go wrong is they reach out and say, hey, I'm applying to your school. Do you have any advice? And they just ask a super generic, super broad question that the schools can't answer. So if you have a specific question, ask it. If you don't, don't worry about it. Your primary application will serve as your interest letter, right? (laughs) Like, hey, I want to come to your school. Like, duh, you just applied here. Um, And then kind of going off of that, um, I'm kind of unclear. So after your interview, um, or potentially much later on, if you haven't heard back, is that when you would send um, like a follow-up letter or a letter of intent? I'm kind of unclear what the difference is, I guess. So follow-up letters in my mind or, or just letter, like update letters are completely useless. The only time I think you should send a letter is probably a letter of intent after an interview. And they work better if you already have an acceptance to say, hey, I have an acceptance, but I really want to come to your school for for these two reasons. And if you accept me, I will come. Update letters are basically, hey, I'm still interested. Hey, I'm still here. Hey, like... For the far, far, far majority of students, they're a waste of time. Now, I I think there are specific reasons. And I I had a student on on the pre-mid years podcast a few months ago, a couple of years ago now, maybe at this point, who was hearing nothing through the application cycle. And we had a very in-depth conversation about what 
her next steps could be. And she had some run-ins with the, I think, director of admissions at a local medical school. She had run into her at different uh, outreach, like community programs, different, different places in the community. And there was something very specific that she was missing in her application or, or she was lacking in her application. And so we sent an update letter to that school. We, we crafted the update letter together, sent an update to that school to say, hey, it's been great seeing you around town. And I know I probably haven't heard anything yet because of this one thing, but here's what I've been doing to work on it. And within the week, she had an interview and then later an acceptance to that school. And so I think they can be very strategic. Where most students go wrong is that they're they're not strategic about them at all. They just update, 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 contact, 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 contact. And it just gets super annoying for every medical school. Thank you. You are welcome. What else can I help you with? So I guess this is something that you probably get asked a lot. So I'm not going to ask it. Um, I'm sure everybody's asking (laughs) right now. Um, I'm lacking clinical experience due to COVID. Um, What can I do about that? Um, Obviously not too much in some places right now, I guess. Um, So I'm just wondering, would you, for this upcoming cycle, would you recommend um, putting uh, down e-shadowing on your application? Like, is Mm -hmm. that something schools will take seriously, I guess? Yeah, some schools will, some schools won't. It'll just depend on, on the school. But uh, I think the the far majority of schools are going to have to look at it and go, it's better than nothing. So I, I would definitely put all of your virtual and e-shadowing and, and other stuff on your application. Obviously, ideally, you have in-person shadowing as well, and you have clinical experience. The problem that we're going to see moving forward, especially this current application cycle that's coming up here May and June of 2021, is that for students who since March of 2020 don't have anything and they didn't have anything before, but who are still going to apply are going to be hurting. I don't think those students should apply. And I don't know if you're one of those students, uh, but I, I think if you are applying to medical school with zero clinical experience and you're gonna say, but COVID, and you have zero in-person shadowing experience, and you're going to say, but COVID, at the end of the day, the question will be, do you know what you're getting yourself into? COVID cannot be an excuse to go down this path, get $400,000 in debt, spend four years of your life doing something where on the other end, you may be miserable because you didn't understand what medicine, healthcare, and being a physician is all about in this country. You can't blame COVID for that. You have to get those experiences. For students who had experiences and then had those experiences diminished because of COVID, that's a completely different story. You had already been doing something beforehand. There are plenty of opportunities to get experiences right now. Hospitals are still operating. Jobs are still out there. The question will come down to, what is your risk tolerance? Are you someone who is okay with going and getting a scribe job? Right, and there's a lot of privilege around that, right? To be able to go out and live on your own and not have anybody else to worry about. But if you live at home and your parents are at risk or your grandparents who you live with are at risk, of COVID and they haven't had the vaccine yet and and you're worried about going and getting a job in a clinical setting, like that's, there's a lot of privilege involved with that, but there are opportunities available because hospitals still need scribes. Hospitals still need someone to transport the patient from point A to point B. Hospitals still need someone to interact in the emergency department with patients. So hospitals are still hiring but a lot of the volunteer opportunities are gone because the volunteer opportunities are usually extra positions and stuff that aren't technically needed. So there, there's there's a lot of potential opportunities out there for you if you're willing and, and are able to, but there's going to be a really big question mark 
for students applying in May and June of 2021 who aren't going to have clinical or shadowing experience and are going to say, but COVID. And I don't think that's going to fly. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. Anything else? Um, just real quick thing. So um, this year, I think the first day to submit your application sometime at the end of May, I think. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, if I want to um, submit like the day it opens or as early as possible, but my um, transcript is not ready because my semester was pushed back yep. later. Yep. Um, how exactly does that work? Like, will that delay my application? For AMCAS, it won't because you don't technically need your spring grades in AMCAS to submit your applications. You can you can put the, the classes in AMCAS and say that your grade is pending and it'll show on as a future slash current course or something, however AMCAS classifies it. For Comus and TMDSAS, they require those spring grades. So you'll, oh, okay. you'll just have to wait. Uh, it, it really depends on if you need those grades or not. And it, it's funny, I, we just had this conversation on 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 the last, I think, episode of Ask Dr. Gray. Um, it, because if you need, right, and, and that's a very subjective term, if you need those grades to show academic ability, to show that you've overcome some early academic struggles, then you're probably better off waiting. Those few weeks that you're going to have to wait for the grades are probably better than submitting without the grades, but having a worse GPA trend or GPA total because you wanted to rush your application in. I see what you mean. So if I were to submit it immediately without uh, my spring grades, would I have to eventually update it once I get those grades or is that not how it works? Nope. AMCAS and ACOMAS, you can't update grades after you submit. TMDSAS, you can, uh, uh but but once you submit your grades through AMCAS and ACOMAS, once you submit, you submit their whole verification process is reviewing the transcripts that are sent by the schools, reviewing all of the grades that you've put into the application, adjudicating those, making sure that everything lines up and everything you, you said you got an A is actually an A on your transcript. They're verifying all that information. They're putting their stamp of approval on it and sending it to the schools. And so they don't have a process to update those grades when new grades come in. So if, if I'm in a position where I'm currently, I'm happy with my grades and my GPA, would you recommend submitting as early as possible without the spring grades or waiting a few weeks to get them and it won't necessarily make a difference anyway. Are your stats great? They're I'm okay with them. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if, if that's earlier, the case, if that's the case, then you can go ahead and submit. I, again, I don't think a couple of weeks will hurt you. I, I think based on this last cycle that we had kind of near the beginning of COVID when uh, kind of May and June of 2020. And we had the WMC delaying the verification process and submission to medical schools. We may see that again this year. So a couple of weeks probably won't hurt you in the grand scheme of things. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for answering all my questions. You are welcome. <laughs>